Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. All right. Um, welcome to everyone that's that's here. Looks like we're a bit thin in the ranks here in the sanctuary this morning, but hopefully some more folks will trickle in. Um, and good morning to you if you happen to be listening out over the airwaves while we're radio broadcasting. And also hello to you if you're joining us a little bit later on YouTube. One way or the other. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to res- be glorified this morning. Mm. No matter how many or how few or what the formatting is, doesn't matter. <laughs> He's already conquered the grave, so we're just... It's interesting to think of every single Sunday as a victory lap, but that's really what it is <laughs> every single time. We're not waiting for work to be... Or we're not waiting for salvation to be finished but rather salvation has come and we're just waiting now to be perfected. All right. So I invite everyone to stand. I'll give us an opening prayer and we'll get into a time of worship this morning. Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, for salvation. God, thank you that when we come here, and accept you as our Lord and Savior when we did that originally, Lord. At that moment, you saved us, God. And we just accepted what you did for us, Lord Jesus. God, we praise you that in you our sins can be forgiven and are forgiven, Lord. What we could not do ourselves, God, you took upon yourself. And you worked out the plan of salvation for us. God, we pray that you would focus our minds and hearts this morning. There's agendas, there's worldly cares, there's all sorts of stuff knocking about in our imperfect human brains. But, Lord, right now, this time is for you, God. So we pray that we can just focus on you entirely and focus on lifting up your name and on treating this, treating your gift, your work, as the victory (laughs) that it is. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've poured into each of our lives, God. And thank you for walking with us in the hard times. We declare that you are our God, that we are your children, and that we want to follow you. In your name we pray, amen. Glory of the Lord, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord. Joy of the King rise among us and arise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the glory. Let it ride. 
My heart is overwhelmed. When my heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others fall. You are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you've song in the night 
trust in you. One day, one day when heaven is filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Wood became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Hands that heal nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, He loved me, dying, He saved me, buried. Sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. from the door then he arose over death he had conquered now he's ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him from rising again living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day seated. Now we'll have uh, Brother Mike give us a communion devotion this morning. 
How many times have you been on the journey away? Not for necessarily what this guy is, but just for your own stuff, for your own thing. You wanted to try something different. You wanted to try your own path. You know, maybe some of us are on that path now, heading away. Maybe some of us are coming back. But I don't know. Only you know and God knows. But if it wasn't for our Savior on the cross, the Father wouldn't run out to us. Because as we're walking back, right, he's saying all these things I'm going to do. I'm going to ask him for forgiveness. I'm going to live in, the, in, in the, the servant's cottage. I'm not going to be a son anymore. I'm going to do this and that. But the father had a different idea. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me, give me my share of the estate, which, as we all know, is illegal because he's still alive, the father. So he divided his property between them. Not longer after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off, all he had set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, I mean, he had, he didn't even have a clue. He didn't even have a clue. But the father did. The father does. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. Here's a, here's a Jewish boy feeding pigs who sent him to his fields to, be, to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. I will set out and go back to God. Maybe some of us thinking that. I have sinned against heaven and against you. I, oh, I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now, you can imagine on his journey couple days maybe I don't I don't know probably all the things going through his mind so he got up and went, went to his father but while he was still a long way off his father saw him and was filled with compassion after what this guy what this kid has done he's filled with compassion for him for he ran to his son. Imagine a guy with the, the long skirt thing on, running. Um, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Hmm. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he's like, his father said, shh, shh, shh. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, which was the kind of the signet ring, kind of the ring you can go into town and buy good stuff. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he had, has him back safe and sound. Wow, he was ticked off, wasn't he? Older brother was ticked off on the grace. It's kind of like the Pharisees were ticked off at Jesus when he healed on the Sabbath. Kind of reminds me of that, ticked off. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out. So God went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Which kind of is a lie because the Bible says we all have sinned. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And now everything he has is, is, his, is his, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and is found. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus who died on that cross. Lord, forgive us of our iniquities, our sins. Help us to repent. Help us to turn. Help us to turn towards you no matter what we do in everyday life. Lord, just let help us to turn towards you because you saved us, God. That's you running out to us. And maybe there are some of us, I know I've been there, running back and forth, running back and forth. God, but help us, help us to stop leaving. Help us to stop running. I know we're not losing our salvation, God, but we're losing we're losing a lot of joy. God, but your grace covers all. Lord, but help us, help us to be teachable from others. Help us to be teachable from you, Lord, in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. <laughs>
is the power of Christ in me from, from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of death no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns be concludes the indoor portion of our service, so I invite everyone to head on out to the biblical garden for our praise time and our sermon time. Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. It, I love you. It's good to see you. Let's go to our great God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit has gathered us together here. Lord, I pray that you'd guide and counsel us as there's Many places that are doing better in COVID and wildfires than we thought at this point. But Lord, there's always risk out there. So Lord, I pray you'd help us, especially as we think about finances today in the sermon. Lord, that every good blessing comes from you, Lord, and we are grateful. Lord, help us to continuously rely on you and help us always to be a people of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. This uh, sermon I call... High rollers or high raxes? Why? Well, it's on money. <laughs> Collection box. And uh, an intriguing verse on that I, I came across, I want to start with. Chapter 30, verse 25 and following, it says, Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. High raxes are creatures of little power, and yet they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in the king's palace. High roller or high raxes? I was intrigued reading through that. It's not necessarily pertaining to finances there in Proverbs, but it does talk about how weak, powerless little things can really accomplish some amazing things, and you're not as powerless as you think you are which is an important lesson for us regarding finances. Um, first off, it talks about ants, how, what a great work ethic they have. Then it talks about hyraxes. You know what a hyrax is? A hyrax is a large rat, is what it is, about one to two feet in length, about 10-pound rat, very short tail. 
But the thing about it is that as unseemly as it is, it has a home in the crags, a place inaccessible to their, by their predators, and uh, has a pretty nice view. Safe, secure, nice view. That's what a hyrax gets. It goes on to talk about grasshoppers, or look, excuse me, locusts, and how they can devastate things like an army can. And then finally, it talks about how a lizard can be found in the king's palace. I had just a mental image in my head that when Solomon, who wrote Proverbs, was trying to impress somebody, maybe the Queen of Sheba, and uh, she comes on in, and the palace is decorated, has gold, silver, trumpeters playing, blah, 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 servants everywhere, trying to impress and as people are talking, there goes a little lizard right across the floor in front of everybody. Yeah, even in the king's palace, you get your lizards. The powerless can make a dent in a lot of things. Never say your things are beyond your control in order to be able to change things, including in finances. Well, the book of Proverbs doesn't have a, a, a whole lot of uh, stock market tips or things, but it does give us a few clues that are a whole lot easier to understand regarding how to manage the blessings that God puts in our lives. We call that stewardship. The first thing it talks to us about is about righteousness, the life of the righteous individual. Chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. I walk in, it, um, wisdom is speaking here as if it's personified, and it says this, I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths, paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasuries. Wisdom, and you want to fill my treasury at any time, you go right ahead. The thing is, that when it's talking here, is that righteousness doesn't necessarily make you a better person in a lot of respects or more deserving, but there are things that are the result of the righteous life, of which financial blessings are part of those things. For instance, in chapter 22, verse 4, it says, The reward of humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. The person who chooses righteousness for their lifestyle, they will have opportunities that other people who don't choose that are not going to have. The slugger, the lazy bum, are not going to have the options that the righteous person has because of choices. The um, glutton, that's the person who gets the paycheck and then they eat the whole thing like that. Self-gratification. They also will not have opportunities that the person who shows savings is going to have. Uh, the uh, person who is um, uh, not just a sluggard, the, the uh, glutton, but the irresponsible. The irresponsible person is not going to have the opportunities that a responsible person is going to have. And that's kind of the idea. If you are righteous, things are going to happen for you simply because of that choice. And not just financial, many other things as well. Well, the second thing uh, Jesus said back in uh, Matthew chapter 6, during the Sermon on the Mount, verse 33, Seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Step one, Righteousness. Back when Solomon was first starting his king, uh, kingship, God asked him, tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. One wish, and he chose wisdom. Because he made the right choice on that, God gave him other things too, similar with righteousness. Well, the second thing it tells us about is a plan. You have to have a plan. Just because you decide, I'm going to live a righteous life, God doesn't just automatically drop the check in the mail to you. You need to have a plan. Chapter 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. Yeah, the person who has a plan and works that plan talks to other people, learns from other people, researches. They're going to have advantages that the person who just wings it and shoots from the hip and uh, makes it up as he goes along, the hasty person is talking about. Uh, you need to have a plan as you, as you proceed through things. Chapter 27, verses 23 and 24. 
Know well the condition of your flocks, and pay attention to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure at all generations. Kind of the idea behind this is a person who's in a shepherding family. Mom and dad have been shepherds all their lives. They made money. I guess it's my turn. I'll just do what mom and dad did and, you know, just repeat, 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 and um, make my money that way. And this is saying, uh-uh, that's not good enough of a plan because it says you need to keep inspecting your flocks, keep eyeballing them, do your research. What works? Because things change. Oh, the old phrase coming from Job, who anybody knew that things can change is him. He says, the Lord giveth, and what? The Lord taketh away. Times change. It even says in there that a crown does not stay for all generations. He knew that for himself. He had the crown. His two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, they were going to split the kingdom. They'd be half kings from then on. It does not last forever. So you have to be able to have your plan. The third thing talks about a gift, the gift or generosity. If you want to be able to do well, you need to be a person who's a giver in order to be a good receiver. Chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Mm -hmm. In that phrase, it talks about first fruits. And by the way, is the section why I'm sitting here next to the collection box. It talks about the festival of first fruits. It happened at the end of spring, beginning of summer. The idea was for farmers who had their fruits to bring them the first collection of them to the temple and sacrifice them. The thing is, is that this was a vulnerable time. There wasn't a whole lot of real rich farmland near the temple. Maybe if you were an olive guy from the Mount of Olives, or there might be some fig trees around there, but as far as the big wheat production and the things that mostly the people ate, you had to travel a little ways to get to Jerusalem to sacrifice at the temple. And so while you're there on that trip, your crops are back in the field ripening. And a lot of things can happen in those few days that you take to make your quick vacation trip to Jerusalem. Locusts can devour them. Fire can devour them. Thieves can take them and so on without you there. It's a vulnerable time. Tithing is a vulnerable type thing. You are saying, yes, I can do better on 90% than 100%. Tithing will change how certain things happen for you. I remember back in our young family when we were trying to buy a house in the town we lived in before we came here. And uh, the real estate agent was doing their job trying to show us other things around, including things outside of our budget. And we were at a nice house in a nice neighborhood. And I was thinking, we can't afford this. How much is this for? They told me the price. It says, we can't afford that. It says, oh, yes, you can. We looked at uh, how much you bring in, the percentage of that. Boom, the payment for this house would fit in that. And they said, but I have something in my budget that maybe many people don't have. I tithe. <laughs> that 10%, yeah, kicked us out of one neighborhood and down to another, which was a fine neighborhood and a fine house. And we did fine. But we give to God not because he's worthwhile, but because he's worthy. We tithe. We don't tip God. We don't ask, well, how good was your service? You know, God, remember that prayer request you still haven't fulfilled yet? Those three red lights I got when I was rushing to a meeting that I was already real late for? You could have changed that, you know. Here I am at church. I'm really not feeling the buzz anymore. Come on, God. Where's the Holy Spirit? We're not paying God for his performances to our estimation, but because he is worthy. Giving is important. God's looking for it. And yes, it is vulnerable. Very blessed too, according to this verse. But uh, yeah, it is vulnerable. But the second part of giving has to do with blessing and refreshing the people around you. For instance, it says, chapter 11, verse 24. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 
Blessing other people, it's important. Some uh, Christian financial uh, counselors call this financial breathing. In order to get something in, you have to let out. You have to be a giver in order to be a receiver. It just works that way. I've never really understood what happened in the old um, uh, stock market where you have these guys standing in the pits and trading and yelling and screaming at one another. I understand all that's done computer-wise now and so on. But um, the thing about a business and trade is that, yeah, you want to make money off of your customer. And they also want to get a good or a service off of you, too, in which they think they're getting a fair deal as well. The thing is, you don't want to get too good or get things too far out of balance because if your blessing causes the demise of somebody else, then part of your future just died. The trade is part of a community, part of a network, part of a free flow of ideas and care and concern and money and interest and so on. And so it is when you bless other people, you refresh their hearts by being generous because they, in staying afloat in the future, their blessing of you also stays in play into the future. Matter of fact, nowadays in society, it seems like just about every other story on the news has to do with individuals' mental health or emotional well-being and so on. Well, one of the things a lot of psychologists have found, a big difference between the people who are mentally, emotionally, well-balanced versus people who are on the extreme ends, one of the big differences is generosity. People well-balanced are generous. The ones that are on the fringe, they're the ones that are hoarding and packing up all sorts of weird stuff and could care less about their fellow man. Tunes them out. You're doing yourself a favor when you are blessing other people. Well, the fourth thing. And this starts getting into the problematic parts in finances. We call this the cheater. Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord detests dishonest scales, but accurate weights find favor with him. Dishonest scales. The only scales I deal with on a continual basis are the ones on my bathroom floor. And man, how I wish they were dishonest, but they're not. See, back in this time in the public marketplace, if you were selling wheat or some other commodity, you might have two different sets of rocks to put on the scales to balance things out. If you were wanting to sell something, your rock might be just a little bit less than a pound so that you could give a little bit less than a pound for the dollar. But if you were buying from your supplier, he would want your rock to be a little bit more than a pound so you could get a little bit more without actually having to pay for it. And evidently this was a problem because not just in this verse, but four other verses throughout Proverbs says God hates dishonest scales. People were cheaters and God doesn't like that. It goes on to talk in chapter 13, verse 11. It says, wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Fraud dwindles. It's not just what you got on your bottom line. How did you get it? That's what matters to God. Cheating to get there? Not a good thing. Matter of fact, the second half of that verse talks about people who just work the old-fashioned way and attain their money that way. Those ones are the ones who make out well. Will the person who's trying to get money by avoiding work at all costs, will they get money? Yeah, yeah, they will. You know, some people... Their solution is playing the lottery. That's how I'm going to get my money. Others hit up a relative for the thousandth time for a little bit of money, tie them over for a while. And yeah, they're going to get their dollars. People that are out there looking for the program that's going to give them what they need without them having to lift a finger. That's what a lot of this has to do. We talked about some of this back when we talked about the sloth and work ethic. Um, the thing is, people like that, they will get their dollars. They will. However, according to this verse, they get dollars that have termites in them. Those termites will not only eat up the dollar that they're given, but they will eat up the remainder of dollars that are in that account or in that person's life. That you give something to a person who is avoiding work at all costs, 
you're gonna make them a net negative from that interaction because there is not blessing, there's termites in the money that they are being given. But the person who works the old fashioned way, they're gonna make it. Well, the last thing that we have is I call it the, the hindrance. And this is uh, uh, chapter 17, verse eight, for example. It says, the one who has no sense shakes hands in pledge and puts up security for a neighbor. Well, what's it talk about? Well, let me read one more verse along this same line. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to shake hands in pledge is safe. What's it talking about? It's talking about us being a co-signer with somebody who has not deserved the credit that they're trying to get. It says, don't do that. Matter of fact, chapter six goes, first five verses says, if you co-sign with somebody, try whatever you can do to get out of that relationship. It's a bad thing. What's going on here? We've co-signed with our kids when they're first getting started. Maybe to buy a car, maybe a student loan or something like that. Um, but for nobody else. And so if any of you are thinking, hey, Al, can you co-sign with me? The answer is simple, no. Glad we got that out of the way. Scripture tells me not to. The thing is, is that if you've been doing what these verses say, you're seeking righteousness. You're working your plan. You're being generous. You're watching your ethics. Your ship is good. It's sailing, it's doing the right thing, it's functioning, doing great. Then comes along a person whose boat is sinking. They've not done any of those things, but they want to say, can I tie my boat to yours? That's what the cosign does. If they can't make the payment, they're coming after you. And even if, for some reason, they pay off everything, is there a chance they're going to need some help in the future? And when they do, who are they going to come? Here's another way of putting it. Have you ever made a charitable donation to some place that phone you and they have you on their mailing list? and they have your email, and since then, for decades, you've gotten calendar after calendar, birthday card after birthday card, and invitation to give all throughout the year. Yeah, and they're going to keep after it also. That phrase, till death do us part, that's what happens when you get in a financial connection with people like that. Well, in this, um, we're told not to get involved in this. The thing is, God has your ship floating. And then you're trying to tie yourself to something that sinks. Telling that person they do not need to be doing the same blessing that you've been doing, that God has honored in your life. Uh, God, uh, Jesus tells us in the book of Luke chapter 6, verses 34 and 35, don't loan. Maybe give to people, but don't loan. Never give to somebody something you're going to need back. Give it unilaterally. Tell them, don't repay me under, the, if, under any circumstance. Don't repay the church under any circumstance. If you want to be, if you need money and we give it to you, pay it forward to somebody else. Give it to another worthy cause or an unworthy cause. Don't care. Give it to another church, whatever. But don't let that money come back here. It travels one direction because invariably people who are of good conscience who received something because they were in need, they realize, but I can't pay it back and they feel self-conscious and before you know it, poof, they disappear from the relationship, from the church because they thought they still had to pay it back in their own mind. No, 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 no. Gifts, not loans. Well, that's everything that basically Proverbs has to say about this. And um, in all that, Jesus, when he was sharing the parables, vast majority of parables had to do with financial concerns. And Jesus was the least materialistic person I can imagine. And yet money was a major theme all the time with him. It's part of the world we walk in. It's part of our walk. Let's do it God's way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help each one of us as followers of yours to do this dollars and cents thing your way. There's a million things out there that would like us to do it 
according to greed, according to all sorts of different schools of thought. But Lord, we seek the counsel of the Holy Spirit and righteous people in your word. Lord, this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.